everyone, John Lorden here with another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I have to give a very big thank you for Natasha for helping me research this case. She got me started with a bunch of great information. Uh, I have to say this is a case I've actually been keeping my eye on over the past year. Um, it's got some really interesting developments that have happened lately. I don't know if they're really helpful to the case overall, but we're going to touch on those a little bit. There's also a giant rumor mill swirling around this case. I'm going to try to cut some of that noise out, um, talk about the known facts. I'll let you know what those things are about, but I don't want to spend too much time on information that we can't really verify or that is um, you know, unfounded at this point. So with all that being said, let's get a start. In looking at the case of Michael Chambers, you might recall this, um, in March of 2017, he is a 70-year-old man that went missing from Quinlan, Texas. And the thing that was kind of most talked about in the media about this story is uh, he has a shop that he was working in at home, and there was some blood that was found in the shop. Now, some people seem to minimize how much blood we're talking about. Um, the Vanish podcast did a really good interview with a granddaughter of his. So I believe that's probably the best explanation of the blood. We're talking about uh, several quarter sized droplets. However, there was one particular area that she described as the size of a dinner plate where it looked like there was numerous drops that had created a pool. So a substantial amount of blood, uh, not necessarily enough to say that um, his life was certainly in danger or at risk when he was bleeding from that. But what's interesting is the droplets don't leave the shop area, but of course, somehow Michael has left and we don't know where he is. So as you can see on the top of this poster, there's currently a $25,000 reward. Of course, I will have contact information both for the investigators and for um, if you want to submit an anonymously to Crime Stoppers, I'll have that info down below as well. We're talking about a 70-year-old man. Uh, his hair is gray, but he was balding. He is six foot three inches tall, pretty big man, about 225 pounds. Uh, let's go ahead and jump over to NamUs and see if we can get some more details on this case. Michael Glenn Chambers, missing since March 10th, 2017. For the date last seen for the time, they have it at around 11. Uh, he was basically caught on a Walmart surveillance camera. Um, his wife had asked him to go buy some things at Walmart. It seems like he did. He took those back into the house. Uh, they were found in the home. So... Uh, but that's the last time he was seen. Uh, 70 years old, white male. Um, here they have the height kind of between six foot and six foot five, but all the other sources I've seen are saying six foot three and weight from 220 to 230 pounds. I did notice in some of the photos, it looked like he had a little more weight on him. And I don't know which of those photos are more recent. So uh, it could be that he his weight uh, fluctuates a little bit there as well. Missing from Quinlan, Texas in Hunt County. Mr. Chambers went to Walmart that morning, returned home to work in his shop. Spots of blood found there. Pretty simple description of the circumstances. Um, for head hair, they say partially bald, gray or white, uh, mustache and goatee, blue eyes, wears metal frame glasses that seem to tint in the sunshine. Uh, for scars and marks, he has a small scar on his upper lip from a auto accident. He also has scars on his right knee and both shoulders. And for medical information, they have a very interesting point here. Keep this in mind as we talk about this case, bad knees. And his granddaughter commented on this as well. I've seen actually a couple of references to the fact that he had bad knees. Prior surgery on his right knee and both shoulders. Uh, he worked as a firefighter. Um, I have some friends that are retired firefighters. I know that, um, you know, it's a very demanding and physical job. And uh, sometimes you have to deal with that as you get up in age. But for clothing and accessories, Michael Chambers had blue sweatpants and probably a blue Dallas Fire Department t-shirt and a blue cap. Once again, they note the eyewear. Uh, and for accessories, he might or probably had a black watch on. For transportation methods, all his vehicles 
are found at home. And that's part of the mystery here. His keys are actually found locked up in his shop. Uh, his wallet is found in his shop. A little bit of a question of was some money taken from his wallet? And according to what we hear on the Vanish podcast, his driver's license is missing as well as his cell phone. Um, pretty curious. So possibly some money, driver's license and cell phone seem to be, I think those are the only items that um, we know have been removed. There's a little bit of a debate about a bicycle. We'll, we'll get to that here. Uh, for dental information, they don't have his charting available, which I'm really curious about. As a matter of fact, this NamUs profile is pretty weak. It's on the low to medium end. Uh, for DNA, they say there's a sample available, but it hasn't yet been submitted. I don't know what's happening around that. For fingerprint information, they say it's available elsewhere. Um, they have numerous Im images, some of the images we've already seen, but here's a shot of the watch that he was wearing. A couple more shots of his face that we didn't see on the poster there. So uh, Quinlan in Texas is a rural city in the southern part of Hunt County. Um, it's within the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area. As of the 2010 census, it had a population of only 1,394 people. Very small area, but part of a larger area. From what I understand, Hunt County has over 80,000 residents total. Um, so just to give you some background on the, on the area that we're talking about here. Jumping over to NBCDFW.com. This is an article from March 13th, 2017, only a few days after he goes missing. So let's see what the details were back at that time. The search for a missing retired Dallas firefighter in Hunt County now includes the FBI and Texas Rangers. Very interesting that uh, they get brought into the search here so quickly. I don't know if they're still actively involved with the search. According to some information we hear from the sheriff on a Facebook Live video, it sounds like at least the FBI might still be involved, but there's also a change.org petition we're going to talk about near the end of this video that's trying to get uh, some oversight or a, a different entity to look into this case. On Monday afternoon, the Hunt County Sheriff's Office revealed that a small amount of blood was found inside Chaber's shop next to his Quinlan house. However, there is no sign of a struggle in the shop or in the house. His family attended a press conference late Monday afternoon with Hunt County Sheriff Randy Meeks pleading for help. And here is a shot of Randy Meeks. Chamber spoke with his wife on the phone Friday morning when she returned home that evening just before seven, he was gone. Um, I've seen some different time frames in terms of when she gets home. From what I understand, she texts him at, I think like quarter to six, other time frames I've heard are more like she got home at about 6.15. She got concerned uh, when she couldn't find him, uh, called police around 6.45 or something like that. Uh, police didn't seem to show up immediately. She called a friend of hers, had her come over, called the police again. I think they actually didn't come to uh, talk to her about what was going on until about 7.45 according to a different time frame that I've seen on this. Uh, Meeks told reporters that there is surveillance video of Chambers at the Quinlan Walmart at about 11 on Friday. He says Chambers was alone and was not followed out of the parking lot. Uh, Meeks did not elaborate on what exactly Chambers purchased at the store. From information I've found, it seems like he bought some mascara for his wife. Uh, and some type of medication. I think it might be a cold medication, uh, but one that is specific for people that have blood pressure issues. Uh, according to some web sleuths information I saw, some of his family was commenting over there. It seems like he did have high blood pressure, but that it was treated with medication. Uh, however, if you go looking you know, for like cold medicine or something like that, you want to be sure that you're not going to have a, a conflict happening with your blood pressure medication. So it makes sense that if he needed that for himself, he might look for a product like that. Detectives believe whatever happened to Chambers, it happened between noon and 3 p.m. on Friday. Quote, it's unclear at this time if Mr. Chambers somehow became injured and walked away from the location looking for help or if he was taken against his will, Meeks said. Now, I just want to try to clear one of these things up right off the bat. It's not unclear that he didn't just become injured and walk away looking for help. Because if that is the case, he either would have found help 
and would have been given help. Maybe someone would have called 911 or something, despite the fact he has a cell phone on him. And I don't know why he wouldn't have called for himself. But uh, if he was really badly injured and he went looking for help, he probably would have been found in his driveway, down the road, something along those lines. So I'm just, I'm a little bothered. I'm really struggling w in shooting this video because I'm frustrated, particularly with information coming from Randy Meeks. This is one of the first things when I started looking into this case that bothered me. We know that this first situation he's talking about, the likelihood of that happening is practically zero. Uh, so when you're giving me a statement like this and you're saying, hey, we don't know if he just got hurt and walked away or if he was taken against his will, well, now you've made it seem like if I can't consider your first option, we should really consider the second option. And I don't know that that is necessarily the right way to go about thinking about this case either. Um, there is certainly a third option, which is, did Randy potentially leave of his own accord for some reason? Did he want to escape? Did he want to get away? Did he want to leave his life? We always have to consider that with these missing person cases. Very tough when you're talking about the fact he took maybe just the cash out of his wallet, took a driver's license that would kind of support that, took his cell phone. Uh, I have seen no reports of credit cards being taken. I've seen no reports of large sums of cash being moved out of his accounts or anything like that. So just another consideration we have to kind of put out there. But we also have to remember there is blood in his shop. Now, another consideration for me with that is I don't know how old the blood is. Uh, I'm assuming that they would have recognized if it was from an injury that happened several days before because it probably would have dried. It would have been brown in color. Um, so I would assume that it is blood from the day that he went missing. If that is the case, then we have to consider what happened to him. And we have heard nothing from the sheriffs in particular about, uh, oh, we found a blade that he uses in some aspect of you know him working on cars, or we found a tool that also had his blood on it. it looked like he nicked himself. We have had no information about what potentially caused the wound based on things that were left behind in the shop. And that kind of bothers me. Another thing we don't have in this case is any information about the shop being searched forensically. If we do think that maybe there was possibly an attack in there. You know, I, I don't know that there's always going to be signs of a struggle in an attack. If You're talking about a guy that's six foot three. If I was going to try to incapacitate someone like this, I'm going to try to sneak up on him. I'm going to try to strike him quickly and then do whatever I'm going to do, take him out of, of the house if that's what I want to do. Um, and that's another interesting aspect of this case. Nothing seems to be missing from the home. We've got these few personal effects and maybe a little cash missing pretty much from his person. But if this was like a robbery gone wrong or something like that, um, there, it's just there's not enough to support that. Seems like it's a bit of a personal issue that's going on with him here if there is someone else involved or maybe it's a personal issue with him and himself. Um, I don't know. Some items, including cash, were taken from his home, the sheriff said. His pickup truck was not taken. Once again, his keys are right there in the shop, but they left his truck behind. Uh, his cell phone is missing. Meek said investigators were able to get a ping off the cell phone, but declined to elaborate. A search Friday night that included a trained canine team and a Department of Public Safety helicopter with heat sensing technology turned up no sign of Michael Chambers, a sheriff's office said. Meeks told reporters, reporters, he is a personal friend of Chambers. I'm just going to be honest with you guys. When I bumped into this information, I already told you the first spot already bothered me just about the theorizing. Now we have that this is a personal friend. Apparently they went to church together. Um, Meeks knows both him and his wife. Why is this guy working this case? think, like I said, Hunt County is, uh, the Hunt County Sheriff's Department is covering an area of about 80,000 people. I don't think this is one of those instances where we're talking about a local police force for only a town of a thousand. We're talking about a Sheriff's County for 80,000. There has to be more on staff that could be handling this case than someone that's a personal friend. I see so many problems with this, just in terms of, of biases, of course, but outside of that legal aspects 
what happens if you try to run some charges on this? What if you find out that his wife was indeed involved in some way with this? Uh, a defense attorney, a good defense attorney is going to be able to really pick at pre-existing relationships that are happening between the sheriffs and chambers here. Uh, and that's even assuming that you have a good solid case where you've got a ton of physical evidence. I think it's problematic to me to have a personal friend investigate a disappearance like this because some of these disappearances do turn in to cases with criminal charges. Um, so I'm just, once again, just kind of struggling with what's going on in this area around this case. But back to what Randy said about this. I've never known a more devout Christian man than Michael Chambers, said an emotional Meeks. I trust him with my life. He's a great family man. He loved his wife dearly. And I don't know if somehow he was protecting her. Uh, let's continue jumping over to cbslocal.com. This is two months into the search. It's been exactly two months since retired Dallas firefighter Michael Chambers went missing and investigators still have no leads or answers as to what happened to him or where he is. Uh, investigators say that they work on the case daily and have even brought in Texas EquiSearch, a search and recovery organization based out of Dickinson, uh, to look for the 70-year-old man. Chambers' daughter, Susie LaZoya, told CBS 11 News, quote, someone has to have an answer. It's not possible in this day and age for someone to just disappear without a trace. Now, I have looked at some maps of the area and you do have uh, neighbors. I mean, they're not out in the middle of nowhere, but there is considerable sections of land uh, around their home. So it's feasible to me that like if he wanted to leave of, of his own accord, maybe he could get out, particularly that time of the day, if there's a lot of people that work, um, maybe he could get out without being seen. Um, but he has a cell phone on him. Obviously, there's ping information that police should be looking at. We're going to hear more about that as we roll forward too. Uh, jumping over to WFAA, this is a picture. Um, this is a picture of his daughter. It's been an agonizing 20 weeks without answers for Susie LaSoya. Quote, it's the last thing I think about at night. It's the first thing I think about in the morning. We need answers. Obviously, this case is more perplexing than the typical case. We also hear in this article that the family has hired a private investigator, someone we've talked about on the channel here before, Philip Klein Investigations, now working on this case as well. Uh, you guys probably know I have a little bit of not history, but we've talked to each other via email. Uh, he's let me in on some information about a particular case that I was looking at before. I was kind of impressed by the information that he was able to get. I know I'm critical of his public persona, um, but interesting to see that he is attached to this case. We're actually going to read some of his comments about this case later on as well. His daughter continues, my greatest fear is that someone has killed my father and has literally gotten away with murder. That's my worst fear, she says. I'm convinced this was a crime. I do not think this is just a missing person. Uh, Chambers was a car aficionado and an avid fisherman. He had retired after 36 years as a firefighter. He was affectionately known as Papa to his family. Um, really, really tough to... No, and we don't have great details on his family. There's not an, a lot that's publicly available on that. Seems to me that there's a bit of a disconnect between his wife and his children. I don't know if this is a second wife or a third wife, a, a later marriage from when his kids were born, but there does seem to be some type of disconnect between uh, the kids and I believe it's his current wife, but I, I really can't find solid information on the makeup of this family. Uh, over at firehouse.com, missing Texas firefighter is subject of TV show, and this is just from February of 2018. The disappearance of retired Dallas firefighter Michael Chambers will be featured on the ID show Disappeared. And I actually did hear about that from our source on this. She says that the episode is scheduled to air in early June. So uh, keep an eye out for that as well. Back to NBCDFW.com. Uh, we get an update. This is from April 2nd. Very strange turn that happens here uh, in terms of 
police information being released to the media. A retired Dallas firefighter missing since March 10th, 2017 is believed to have committed suicide according to Hunt County Sheriff Randy Meeks. Quote, I feel like he, he jumped in there himself and committed suicide, Meeks told NBC5 news partner KRLD. It's Sheriff Meek's belief that Michael Chambers jumped to his death from the two-mile bridge on Lake Tawakoni. Uh, Meeks told KRLD, I think it's Tawakoni actually, uh, Meeks told KRLD that investigators were able to trace his cell phone signal to the bridge and divers may check underneath the bridge for a third time in hopes of finding his body. Quote, I feel that he was harmed and I don't want to think it was at his own hand, said Susie LaSoya, one of Chambers' daughters. Um, pretty interesting to me here that we're getting kind of, we're getting a theory. Here we go with another theory from the sheriffs on this. But they're saying it's based on information that has to do with the cell phone ping signal. But we're not getting great detail about this information, uh, and it would have to be better than a ping sig a ping signal. Ping signals can only get you within uh, several miles of where the tower is. The type of information that they're talking about, as we go forward with and get more details with this, pr sounds more like GPS information to me. But um, as a matter of fact, I'm almost certain it's actually GPS information. Let's go ahead and jump forward so we can get some better detail here. Over at krld.radio.com. Sheriff Meeks says an expert was able to track Chambers' phone. Uh, his cell phone last pinged on the bridge. The same phone signal showed Chambers was traveling far too slow for a car and much faster than a walk. Meeks thinks the speed was consistent with a bicycle. Meeks add Chambers had been suffering from severe depression for about three weeks, but he declined to say why. Once again, here we go with some other aspect of a theory. How do you know if someone's suffering with depression for three weeks? Uh, are you that close of a friends with this guy? I mean, are you seeing him more than once a week where you can actually kind of chart that? Or did, did he specifically say to Randy Meeks at some point, hey, boy, the last three weeks have really been getting at me? And even if you... Even if all that's true, why are you releasing this kind of small amount of information to the media without backing it with anything? I mean, if you really think that this is the case at this point, uh, share that information with us. It's not going to blow any potential criminal investigation or trial that's coming up. You're saying that there isn't one. It just it seems to me, particularly with this statement, that there is... A, a game being played with the media's perspective on this case, and I don't know why, and I don't think it's fair to the family. It really upsets me to think about it from the family's point of view. But even outside of that, just reviewing this as a media reviewer, which is all I see myself as in this, it's still bothering me to drop tidbits like this. Yeah, he's been suffering for three weeks. I think he, he went and jumped off a bridge. Well, let's take a look at that bridge. Here it is. Now, I don't know if it's actually two miles long, but you can see it's a substantially long bridge. But let's get closer to the water here. Um, yeah, in case you can't tell, you can kind of tell better out at the horizon. But from where the water line is to the actual bridge is no more than nine feet. Is that really a place where you're going to go to end your life? I don't think a nine-foot drop into the water is... Uh, honestly is is going to to end your life so what is the point of this bridge why would this be a location to do something like that i don't know and then we have this interesting comment about the speed can we get some more details on that over at wfaa.com um there's there's a bit of cleanup that it seems like has to happen around this comment so it's like literally on one day the sheriff is giving out this new theory and then the next day he's kind of apologizing that he shouldn't have talked about this theory. But let's see if we can get more detail here. Uh, the Hunt County Sheriff's Office spent much of Tuesday working to clarify the search for a missing Dallas firefighter remains active one day after the sheriff went public with the theory that Michael Chambers took his own life. Sergeant Jeff Haynes on Tuesday said it was only one of several theories and that the department has not abandoned the search for chambers. This is not a done deal, Haynes said. 
Haynes did confirm that investigators tracked Chambers' cell phone from his home northeast of Quinlan to the bridge over Lake Tawakoni. Tawakoni, sorry, um, at a speed just over two miles per hour. Now, here this next statement: "That's too slow for a car, and a little too fast for a walk." Haynes said. I'm just going to stop you right there. Let's jump over to Wikipedia here and uh, let's talk about walking. And let me let me just also put out there. I, I think when it comes to walking, I have a lot of experience <laughs> because uh, I have done half marathons, full marathons. Uh, I have helped people of all kinds of different ages, uh, all kinds of different body shapes to um, be able to do that goal. I've literally done it with them side by side. And I can tell you the average walking speed before I looked this up for me uh, that I've been able to keep everyone at very consistently is three miles per hour. So that two miles per hour thing makes absolutely no sense. But here at Wikipedia, although walking speeds can vary greatly depending on many factors, the average human walking speed at crosswalks is about 3.1 miles per hour. And then they have a specific note down here, 2.95 miles per hour for older individuals. Both of those things well outside of the spec of what we're talking about that two miles per hour is definitely too slow for a car, but a little too fast for a walk? Absolutely not. And this is actually Jeff Haynes saying this here, um, but I do believe that Meeks has also stated that same information because he apologizes for it later anyway. Susie LaSoya told WFAA on Tuesday, the family is aware of several theories detectives are considering, but received no advance warning that the sheriff would make just one of those theories public this week. Quote, it was a gut punch, LaSoya said. I think if you come to any conclusion before you have all the facts, your conclusion is most likely going to be wrong. And she's raising a very interesting point here. Let's say that his analysis of that cell phone data is spot on. All that's telling us is the cell phone made it to that area and then stopped there. Is it possible, even if Michael did this himself, that he was crossing the bridge and he didn't want to be tracked anymore, so he just threw the cell phone into the water? I think it's possible. Is it possible that someone else had the cell phone and threw it into the water? I think that's also possible. This does not put Michael and his body at that location. This only means his cell phone made it to that bridge and then stopped at that bridge for some reason. Investigators later said they believed a bicycle was missing too that Chambers could have used to ride out to the lake approximately 20 miles from his home. Hold on a second. Two interesting things here. Number one, now we're hearing about a bike that was stolen, but we didn't get that in the previous reports. This is the first time it's being mentioned. Number two, 20 miles from his home? Yes, approximately. According to this map that I pulled, it looks like it's, it's more like over 17. And I guess it depends how far across the bridge he goes. Also note, He's basically riding right around the Walmart Supercenter, the same place he was at earlier that day. For some reason, why would you take a bike ride out there? I, I don't know, when you were already out there earlier in the day. Um, but outside of all this, do you guys remember the information we reviewed at NamUs? This dude has bad knees, had surgery on one of his knees. You think he's going to go for a 20, let's call it 17 mile bike ride? Really? It, it's just this theory is not holding up to any scrutiny of the slightest sense. And of course, we get the biggest thing here, quote, I never knew him to ride a bike, Lasoya said about her father, and definitely not riding that kind of distance. I don't know, guys. So then there is another interesting turn. And like I said, I don't want to go into too much of the rumor mill stuff, but Hunt County Theft Reports is a local Facebook group. Um, I think they started because they wanted to raise awareness to reports of theft in the area, but now they're kind of bleeding over into reporting on other types of crimes in the area as well. You can see their icon is a neighborhood crime watch. Of course, organizations like that, I suppose whole wholeheartedly, you have community members usually donating their time, doing this on the side, trying to make sure them and their neighbors are safe. I think that's pretty awesome. But here we're getting a message about their post of the Michael Chambers update has been deleted. 
unknown how or when, pretty crazy to me. We're not going to repost. If and when we find a reason, I will update. And then there's an update. Someone was logged in from Dallas on our page. Whoever you are, good luck. Password has been changed. Chambers post was reposted. Make sure you all share the heck out of it. Um, what's going on with that post? Well, I can only get a good sense of it from this interview. And this is a Facebook Live interview with Randy Meeks talking about the case. Um, and if I already didn't have enough reason <laughs> to not feel great about this guy, this video certainly does not help it. Like I mentioned, we're talking about a grassroots community organization that's looking to help their, their community be a bit safer. And this guy, uh, about five minutes into this video, just starts attacking the, the person that's asking him questions about other people's comments on this group. It's mind boggling. He is completely focused on it. Uh, he keeps focusing on the fact that he wants to tell the person that runs this Facebook group, you're not really supporting law enforcement. If you supported law enforcement, you wouldn't leave comments like that up there. And the guy's talking about, hey, look, we're getting a thousand comments in one day. How are we supposed to monitor all that and uh, you know, take, take all that down? And quite honestly, I would have hit it more from the angle of does law enforcement support like, you know, First Amendment at all. So what? People are criticizing you about what's going on with this case. Come on. It's it's the social media age. Use some of that. Maybe, you know, the thing that I always say, the comments that really get me, I know that there's something in them that I need to understand better. There's some truth in them that is actually nailing me. Those are the comments that really get me. And you can tell he specifically reads several comments. One of them seems to allude to the fact that he might have a closer relationship with Michael's wife than uh, has been publicly disclosed, let's just say. And that's part of the rumor mill problem around this case as well. Um, I've seen information saying that Michael's wife has several boyfriends. Randy Meeks is certainly one of them. Uh, I don't put a lot of stock into any type of reports like that. Um, it's just, it's not enough. It's even if those situations are going on, that doesn't necessarily mean that what Randy Meeks showed up and asked Michael, Hey, give me your driver's license. And then did something to him. It just, it's not enough. The, the connectivity there doesn't work. Trying to solve a case by looking at motivations for people that are all around the case. I know that that is something that web sleuths in particular do a lot of, um, it's not the strongest way. We have to look at the information that's actually available. We have to look for the physical evidence that can tie this together. I think our time is much better spent doing that because if you're looking into the spider web of people's relationships, um, there's usually a lot to go to find and you're going to find a lot of connectivity that can push you back to those same assumptions and biases that you have. So I, I caution all of us as uh, citizen investigators, let's just say, when we're looking into things like this. But I can tell you this about 25-minute video does not help the perception of Randy Meeks. Uh, he lashes out at uh, Philip Klein in this in several ways, uh, which actually surprises me because one thing I do know about Philip Klein, I, <laughs> it's actually kind of a criticism of him in one way. I feel like sometimes Philip gets too close to the investigators. Uh, he over compliments the investigations in many cases. Uh, he always talks about his coordination. And I've heard from law enforcement officials that say, yes, We've worked with Philip, and yes, he shares everything with us. Uh, here, you have Randy basically saying, no, that's not true, and do a Google search on Philip Klein, which I have done a Google search on Philip Klein. This guy's bad news. He has no law enforcement experience, blah, 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 blah. All right. So Klein, uh, Klein Investigations released a statement on Michael Chambers' case in response to the sheriff's live interview. In his statement, Sheriff Meeks referred to certain issues he has with our firm. His comments were uneducated, as he has never discussed any issues with us. The lead investigator on the team has only met with Sheriff Meeks on one occasion, and the sheriff made no indication of any concerns with our investigation. I know, guys, this feels a little bit like the rumor mill, but there's, I'm, I'm telling you, there's some information in this that we want to get out there as well. Uh, we now question why the sheriff is attempting to run a discrediting campaign as well as steering the case away from a possible criminal act. 
Now, that is a very good point that really resonated me with me when I was watching this video and watching this guy waste an opportunity to share compelling information about the case that can actually elicit tips and instead go off on this side road adventure of trying to prove to this guy that's interviewing him that you really don't care about law enforcement because you let other people talk bad about us. It's it was so off base. It was so off focus. It really makes me question Mr. Meeks and his ability to actually zone in and focus on the task at hand. This interview does not help his public perception. But what's clear to me is he is very concerned about his public perception because he spends so much time trying to attack those negative commenters uh, and Philip Klein's work, of course. The case status. We would like the public to know that we have come to no conclusions whatsoever regarding this case. They are still interviewing witnesses, still going over evidence, but they do want to go on the record with the following statements. We see no evidence of suicide at this time. We're still investigating. We find no missing bike and believe that Mr. Chambers did not have a bike, never rode a bike, could not have rode a bike over 10 miles to a bridge that is nine feet above water, tossed the bike in the lake, then jumped to his death. The height is less than 10 feet, which would not kill him from the fall. I completely agree. Uh, and outside of that, one comment that's interesting that comes up in the Facebook Live is they actually ask for a description of this bike. And Randy Meek says, well, I'll have to get that information and get it back to you. I have not seen that information come out. If any of you see that information, please put it in the comments down below. I've also seen no comments from family that they know what this bike is. So if you happen to find any information like that, please share it with us in the comments down below as well. Uh, uh, one other thing I should clarify. In this video, Randy Meeks does address the speed issue and he changes it saying, no, it's not, it's not two, two and a half miles per hour. It's actually four and a half miles per hour. Well, I am not a bicycle expert. I did look into it several ways. I couldn't find a very strong method for trying to determine what average bike speed is. I know that if you don't get a bike going fast enough, the balance is incredibly tricky on it. But we have a couple of interesting points here. Four and a half miles per hour. Uh, if it's a 20 mile distance, you're talking about close to five hours that this ride took. And if he disappeared at some point between noon and three o'clock, then you don't have that phone winding up off the bridge until at the latest 8 p.m. Uh, it's just, it's a significant amount of time. And the information that I could find about average speeds on bicycles, it's more like 10 miles per hour. Some people even say 12. Uh, I did find specific articles talking about people having trouble keeping a bike balanced somewhere around three to three and a half miles per hour. So riding a bike for several hours at four to four and a half miles per hour, when most of the rest of the world is able to ride comfortably at about 10, does not make much sense to me. What makes more sense to me is possibly you have someone that is jogging. Uh, even speed walkers can very easily exceed four and a half, not even speed walkers, just regular people that are trying to walk fast. I know for me personally, I can hit four miles per hour pretty easily. Um, so four and a half miles per hour, I'm not convinced that that means that there's a bicycle, but just know that's the new information on this bicycle theory, though we don't know about much about the bike. We find the blood found in the workshop indicates foul play and a possible homicide. Rebecca Chambers has refused to interview with our team. That's Michael's wife. We have attempted six times. All other family members have agreed to interview and most have been completed. All friends of the couple have interviewed with the team with the exception of three of the three. One is offered to, to be interviewed with counsel present. We respect that. Uh, as has been publicly discussed, there are and were multiple boyfriends of Ms. Chambers, one of which she was reportedly seeing at the time of the disappearance. Two have agreed to be interviewed and one has already been interviewed. So some considerations there. Um, definitely looks like Klein Investigations is looking in the direction of uh, Rebecca Chambers as well. We're not going to go into it too much on this video. This video is already running really long. But 
there are some interesting steps that happened after he disappeared. She shut off his cell phone, I think within about 10 days of him disappearing. She also shut off uh, his son's cell phone, a son that according to other reports from his family, he was very close with. I don't know if there's something to all that. Uh, she sold a Mustang of his. I've seen on web sleuths that uh, she was given a gift of a Mustang from him, a 66 Mustang. Uh, but on web sleuths, there are people that are saying that they're family members that are saying that's not the same one that she sold. Uh, everyone in the family knew that she was having some type of financial issue. So uh, her selling those things kind of makes sense. And some of the family was saying we were hoping that she would do that rather than file for a death certificate. But it seems like she has actually done both. Um, which I think the family is kind of thrown off by a bit too. Like I said, I don't know if this is, I don't think this is the mother of the children. It seems to me that this is a later relationship. So certainly some strangeness going on around that. Um, but it's really tough, really tough to know. Uh, when Meeks was asked specifically if um, they had given her a lie detector, he wouldn't answer it. So pretty interesting to me that... Um, He's willing to whip around theories without giving much details, but when asked a very direct and important question that I've, you know, in many cases, people have talked about lie detector results, particularly if they help the, if, if they help the person that gave the test in some way, for example, if, yeah, we did ask her and she said she had nothing to do with it and she passed, that information usually comes loose and, and pretty easily from police departments. But in this specific case, he would not give an answer. Um, there is one other kind of strange aspect to this case I wanted to touch on. And I learned about this over at the change.org petition. Um, they're very clear here. This petition is not affiliated with the Chamber's family, but it is posted with their knowledge. Uh, the information it contains has a compilation of public records, family and friends, firsthand knowledge, and other sources that have been vetted and verified. So they've wrote out kind of the whole story here, um, bullet for bullet. So I really recommend that you come and check this out as well. This is a petition where they're looking to ask the Texas Rangers to take over this investigation. Uh, which I kind of think would be a good idea, or at least get this thing assigned to someone else that is not a personal friend of this couple if there is some potential for foul play. We know that blood was found in that room. I think that's enough potential for foul play. It doesn't mean that that's necessarily the case. It just means that if there is going to be you know, some type of criminal trial at some point, why are you risking that trial by having uh, someone work on this that has personal connections? I, I have no idea. Another strange twist, and I really haven't seen this happen in a case before. It's why I want to share it with you guys. In the days previous to July 14th, 2017, a local resident, Bradley Marion Dunn, made claims on social media that he had information on where Mr. Chambers was located at. Chambers' family members spoke with Mr. Dunn during this time. He was encouraged to contact the Hunt County Sheriff's Office. On the day of July 14th, Bradley Dunn met with deputies from the Hunt County Sheriff's Office at a location near the intersection of Farm to Market Road 2101 and Rancho Road in Quinlan. Mr. Dunn, a career criminal, was said to be jittery and under the influence of some type of mind-altering substance. Mr. Dunn was arrested on scene by Hunt County Sheriff's Office for having a handgun on his person. He was booked into the Hunt County Detention Center. He was also charged with a motion to revoke probation. Mr. Dunn is now currently in the custody of the Hunt County Detention Center awaiting disposition of his charges. Now, I've never quite heard of someone going to help law enforcement and law enforcement flipping around and charging them. Uh, and especially with what we're talking about here, I'm pretty sure in Texas, you can actually carry firearms. I think it might have been specifically because he was on probation that he's not allowed to have firearms. So that might have been something that he did that, that was his fault. But what's also interesting here is we have this aspect that, uh, he was supposedly jittery and under the influence of some mind altering substance. Well, where's the charge for that? Why are we not hearing about that charge? Does, was he tested? Did they give him a test and determine that he actually wasn't on anything, uh, or that he was, but they weren't going to charge him with that, but they were going to charge him for having a handgun to get his probation revoked. 
there's just aspects of this that aren't really adding up for me. Uh, I went looking for information on this. I can't find any information on, on his case currently. So if you guys are able to dig up some of that also, please share it in the comments down below with us. Once again, have to give a shout out to the Vanished podcast. Uh, Marissa did an excellent job on this case as usual. It was their 100th episode back when it aired uh, about a year ago now. Web Sleuths has currently six threads going on this case. A lot of good discussion going on there. And on top of supporting the change.org petition, if you are moved to do that, there is also a GoFundMe, Bring Papa Home. Uh, and this is basically to raise funds to hire the private investigation team. As you can see, they are just over halfway on their goal raised in five months. Uh, once again, on behalf of myself and my awesome supporters out there on Patreon and PayPal, thank you guys so much for helping me do things like this. We are going to make a donation to this as well and hope that it helps with this investigation. Uh, hope that some answers come to this family and hope that Michael comes home. That's that's really what this is all about. Uh, tough one, guys. Uh, I, I knew it was going to run long, but um, I didn't realize that it was going to knock me around emotionally like this. Um, I struggle with it because basically because of kind of the same conversation they were having on that Facebook Live. I support law enforcement, but I don't support what's happening in this particular case. This random theorizing and not backing it up with solid information. The thing that drives me nuts is if you do have this ping information that you say you have that basically traces him from Walmart to his home, to the bridge, that means you have specific times that you're not releasing publicly that you're talking about. That means you know when his phone left the shop. Why isn't that time frame released? Why aren't you asking locals back on that day? Do you guys remember specifically at 1.30, did you notice anyone coming out of that shop? Did you notice anyone driving down this street from 1.30 to 2.30, 2.30 to 3, all the way getting to that bridge, which, uh, you know, look at the hours we're talking about here. And on a Friday afternoon going into evening, uh, even for a small town, you're going to have traffic out there. Did someone notice someone on a bike, particularly on the bridge? Wouldn't that kind of stick in your head a little bit? You got that little narrow bridge. I just, I don't know. But the information is not being disseminated correctly to help the public know what to look for in terms of getting those tips back to police. And that really frustrates me. But they're winging around these theories hurting the family on, 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 the, on the side of that as well. Uh, and I don't really find that respectful. Um, of course, you have to think about, did he possibly harm himself in this case? It doesn't mean that you have to go talking about it publicly to media sources and giving them just a little sprinkle of information. Well, this is why I think that. We have this ping information. Well, then how about we use that ping information to help us with other theories in this as well? That's really where I'm most frustrated with this case. And I'm sure that's only a fraction of what the family is going through. My heart goes out to you guys. So uh, this is where I turn it over to you, Brain Scratchers. Please look into it. I'll have all the links down below. Uh, on top of that, there's just a lot more information to go into here. Um, if you can find more solid information about who might be involved in this, I'm certainly willing to check it out. But it, it's got to be better than blog postings, you know, thread discussions, um, there's got to be some physical aspect where we can start questioning. Uh, you know, for example, w was she working that day? Uh, we know that she, I believe she works as a nurse traveling from location to location, helping people. Uh, did the investigators ever comment that, yeah, we verified that she, you know, worked all the way up until 6 PM. She was at this part of town or something along those lines. If you can find that type of solid info, I'm certainly willing to talk more about, uh, her potential involvement. But at, at this point, there's just, there's not enough, quite enough there. Uh, what it does seem like, even according to client investigations, there's definitely some personal problems going on in this relationship. I've got a very strong sense of a disconnect between uh, the children and her. Um, I'm not sure what that's quite about either. So there's something weird going on in that at least on a family level. I just don't know that that's tied necessarily to what has happened to Michael. But 
Let's talk about it in the comments below. As usual, I'll, I will ask that we please stay respectful. Uh, we could talk about anything. It's just a matter of really um, being respectful to the fact that uh, family members are going to come. They're going to see this thread. They might go looking through it for ideas, different things to explore. Those really good points that many of you out there bring up. So uh, let's let's try to make sure that those are the highlight of the conversation down there, and not you know some back and forth you know argument between two people or something like that. So take care, everyone. Thank you so much for spending all this time with me on this case today. It's it's an important one. It's a tough one. Um, and I'm just happy to have shared it with you and to get more eyes and ears and minds thinking about this and hopefully help bringing this case to some type of close. Please come back tomorrow to the Lord and Arts channel. I'll see you there. <laughs>